we'll just get this started. Okay, I'm excited. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, me too. Thank you for inviting us. Oh, a pleasure. Hello everyone, welcome to the NEM event by Sue Toronto. I'm Farrell Kakar, I'm the program director at Sue Toronto and uh, we will be starting shortly, probably in 30 seconds to just let all the participants get in. We're so excited to have you tonight. <laughs> okay. Great. By the way, Zoom screen looks so happy, actually. It seems like it's dancing so many videos yes. on. <laughs> I know, it's so active. Yeah. That's it true. is working really well. Yeah, you guys organized really nice events. Thank you so much. Coming in a, a wonderful day with a nice weather, so we all have a positive energy. Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, hopefully. Okay, so 30 seconds is almost getting over. Let me share my screen here. Okay. Well, again, welcome everyone. This is Ferro Kakar and uh, I am uh, I'm a PhD student for, for life for living and <laughs> at Ryerson University, but at the same time, I'm the program director and board member of the SUE Toronto, and I'm very, very happy to host this event tonight along my great um, coordinators, uh, Shelza, Janel, Preksha, and everyone, Julia, where are you guys? I, with everyone here. Uh, <laughs> Tell you a little bit about uh, Sue Toronto. We're a group of uh, enthusiastic women engineers who are working towards making, creating a community where all feel, everyone, all the women engineers in GTA feel belong to it. And uh, we do a lot of um, events to do capacity building and uh, also, we wanna um, we wanna just work towards creating this community, making this bigger and bigger and more influential. Okay, and for tonight, we will have a panel discussion and networking session with four influential panelists and 10 keynote speakers, which we are so honored to have them. And uh, thank you also to our six partners who are sponsoring this event. Okay, and this is our Sue Toronto family uh, to just give you an idea of who we are and uh, you could be part of us. We're so happy to always have new members and to welcome you to our our board. For today, uh, we will have uh, the introduction to our panel so you get to know them better at the beginning for 20 minutes with Shelza. She will be uh, walking through introducing everyone. And also after that, we will have two main parts for this event. The first part will be the panel discussion. Uh, where I will be uh, moderating with our four amazing panelists. And then after that, we will have small panels in five different rooms. It, imagine this is a conference. I know it's very tough uh, that we're missing the in-person stuff to go to the conference and then to get out of the big room and go to the small room. So we wanna just you know mimic that and have that in the virtual world. So after this panel discussion, you can walk out, go to the um, small breakout rooms, go to any room you want and, and just listen to the dis discussions. And also we will have the Q&A following the panel discussion in the main rooms if you have questions to stay in the main room. And after we're done with the small panels, then we come back together to just say bye to each other and to exchange our contacts and network with each other. Okay. And just uh, to welcome you guys with a land acknowledgement, I, I would like to begin by acknowledging the indigenous people of all the lands that we're on today. When we meet today on a virtual platform, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the land, which we all call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to improving our own understanding of local indigenous peoples and their cultures. From coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all the Inuit, 
Métis, and First Nations people that call this nation home. Please join me in a moment of re reflection to acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and to consider how we are and can each, in our own way, try to move forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Awesome. Now I would like to call out our Zoom host. You know, nowadays uh, our, our Zoom hosts are the leader. She has all the authority to press any buttons. Okay, so <laughs> Julia. <laughs> The floor Hi, is everyone. Tell us the Zoom rules. What should we do today? All right. So if anybody needs help throughout the uh, any time throughout the event, you can always come back. If let's say you're in a breakout room, you can always come back to the main room. Um, that's where I'll try to be, um, and you'll be able to message me through the chat directly through there. So my name is Julia uh, Tasoltis with a with a T. If there's another Julia that happens to be here um, at work, this is never the case, but. Here there could be, <laughs> and so um, so if, if any, anyone needs any any help with anything, feel free to message me um, through the chat. Um, and again, what we're going to be doing today is you're going to be able to choose your own breakout rooms. Um, and you'll notice once I open up the breakout rooms that they're called um, the titles of the the titles of the rooms uh, of the events are going to be the titles of each of the rooms. So you guys to choose which one you want to be. In. Um, so that's pretty exciting for us. So I hope you guys have a really good day. And if you need anything, just let me know. Hey, thank you so much. And this is the moment that we are taking, we're making memories by taking pictures, okay? So turn on your cameras if you wanna be in the picture and have the biggest, nice smile on your face. <laughs> okay, Julia, are you on it? Give me one second. Cause I sure. want to remove you guys. Put it in okay. the gallery. I can only fit so many people, so I might have to take a couple of pictures. For sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay, by one. 15, 20, 25 people. So I'll do the first smile. If you Mostly if you have the background on, you're in this picture. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. <laughs> All right, everybody say cheese. One, two, three. Stinky cheese. cheese. All right, I'm going to do this a couple more times. All right, and if you cheese. are... Yeah, I think this will work just fine. Okay, and if you don't have a background for Sui, except for Marissa, because she's on my screen, <laughs> then you say cheese. One, two, three. Awesome. <laughs> it's and still that it. And then everybody else um, just has their <laughs> video and camera off, so I won't take uh, I won't take your picture there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Julia. Whereas my, okay, I have like tons of windows open, my apologies. Okay, great. So we took the picture. Now I would like to invite our partner from ACES to just give us an introduction about uh, the, their company. And uh, I am really happy for this partnership. Hi, it's Aisha. I'm Monique Tulibahi and Ishek. What did you mean? Ishlan Kainazani Bashishniash Gansha Che Tohaglin Deshanelit. Hello everyone, my name is Monique and I work for the American Indian Science and Engineering Society, ACES for short. We are a nonprofit organization dedicated to boosting the number of Indigenous professionals in the STEM fields. We work with a number of individuals both in Canada and the US and we offer support like scholarships and internships and of course mentorships to our members. Our members range from kindergartners all the way to retirees. We have a lot to offer and invite you, and we also invite you all to join ACES in our mission. Anyone can be a member of ACES, as I am sure you are all aware of. From diversity comes great ideas. We also host a number of events to help our members network and learn of new opportunities. For more information about ACES, please visit our website. Thank you. I knew that. Thank you very much, Monique. <laughs> I uh, appreciate it. Our next partner uh, from EHRC, the floor is yours. Everybody, uh, thanks so much to Sway for having us today. Uh, my name is Paige and I'm here on behalf of Electricity Human Resources Canada or EHRC. We are thrilled to be able to support this evening's event and would like to congratulate Sway on yet another great uh, organizing effort on their behalf. Um, EHRC is a national not-for-profit organization that conducts research and develops tools to support the human resources needs and challenges uh, that the electricity and renewable sectors face. Founded in 2005, EHRC creates partnerships between business, 
labor, education, and government. Our mission is to strengthen the ability of Canada's electricity industry to meet current and future needs of a safety-focused, highly skilled, and diverse workforce. Um, some of our recent, project, uh, recent projects address diversity, equity, inclusion uh, in the sector, as well as pathways for youth as they explore and enter the workforce. Um, if you have any specific questions or you would like to know more about our organization, feel free to get in touch with me. My email is on the screen now, uh, and definitely check out our website, electricityhr.ca. We have lots of resources and uh, additional information there. So thanks again to Sui, and I'll hand it back over to our hosts. Thank you very much, Paige. Um, our next partner is uh, the Association of Consulting Engineering Companies, Ontario. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, and uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Bruce Matthews. I'm the Executive Director at the Association of Consulting Engineering Companies, Ontario. And we're very pleased to be one of the partners for this session about lifelong learning. Now, I hate to say it, but the knowledge that you gain during your university programs has a limited shelf life. And the pace of change in the modern world means that that shelf life has become shorter over the past couple of decades. Now, engineers are problem solvers by nature. They plan, facilitate, and drive change to create a better world. Creating positive change requires effort, but effort alone isn't enough. The second law of thermodynamics, which most of you should know, tells us that change is inevitable, but without input and control, change tends toward disorder and chaos. And solving the social and environmental and economic challenges of today requires the best possible understanding of science and design, which can only be obtained through continuous learning. I like to say that engineering exists at the intersection of scientific principles and design principles. Consulting engineers and the firms they work for are centers of excellence of thought leadership for a broad range of today's challenges. Consulting engineers have designed and built much of our public infrastructure, and they also support private clients in areas like land development, mining, energy, aerospace, and forensics. Every year, ACEC Ontario recognizes and celebrates the best work of our member firms at the Ontario Engineering Project Awards. This year's ceremony will be presented via video on May 20th, and I encourage you to tune in and learn about the top tier of consulting engineering projects. More information is available at our website, acecontario.ca. With that, I wish you all for all the best for a great panel discussion, and I'll turn it back to Farouk. Thank you very much, uh, Matthews. I appreciate it. Um, and our, our next partner is from Winset. The floor is yours. Merrick, are you there? Hi, it's uh, Mark Latham, Chair of Winset. Uh, just a little bit uh, about uh, our organization. We uh, we are, um, our vision of the world is one where women um, have, are fully um, able to participate in science, engineering, trades, and technology. We um, do that in a kind of a twofold approach. We help by uh, giving women the tools they need to thrive in, the, in the, these mainly male dominated uh, workplaces. Uh, we do that through, uh, or used to do it through a series of live workshops, but these days we're doing it in online webinars that are leadership uh, 90 minute skill builders. We also work on research projects with partners that are focused on improving workplace culture so that um, either more welcoming, more respectful, more inclusive of women. And uh, the ultimate goal is to um, in make them more fair and equitable workplaces where there are more women advanced to lead at all levels in those organizations. And uh, please, if anyone is interested in learning more, you'll see um, on the screen uh, some of our social media uh, information. And I would think my contact information will come up at some point when you're doing the introduction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. I really appreciate it. Okay. Uh, now that you have known about uh, our partners, it's a time to get to know our amazing panelists, okay? So I would give the floor to Shelza and she will introduce all our amazing panelists to you. Shelza? 
Thank you so much, Farooq. First of all, everybody, warm welcome on this virtual stage. I know we have a pack agenda full of learning from our experts this evening. So without much further ado, I would like to welcome on this virtual stage our panelist, Dr. Alejandro Adam. So please put your uh, big round, please give a big round of applause for Dr. Alejandro Adam. Hey. Where's the reaction? <laughs> yeah, and you can get this uh, virtually as well. You will find the tab under your the reaction tab on the Zoom screen. Thank you. So uh, one minute, talk about myself. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. So, first, I have to correct the slide. I am not an engineer. I am the closest thing to an engineer. I'm a mathematician and uh, a big fan of all engineers. But maybe uh, in my calculus lectures, I gave engineers a hard time. So, uh, but uh, I, I really appreciate uh, being here. Uh, I am a professor of mathematics at UBC and currently a president of the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada. Uh, previously, I was uh, CEO of MITEX, which uh, created lots of uh, experiential uh, education opportunities and job placement uh, opportunities. So I'm here to, to listen, to learn, and tell you a bit about what we do at NSERC and my views on lifelong learning. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Alejandro, for sharing more about you. We're excited to hear more in our panel discussion as well as in the breakout room. And thank you, audience, for your great attention. Now let me welcome on this virtual stage, Mark Latham. So give a massive round of applause virtually for our, another panelist this evening. Mark Hi. Latham, the stage is yours. My name is Marg Latham and I am a professional engineer and a certified management consultant. Um, I kind of divide my career into three parts. Uh, over the last decade, I've run my own business as a consultant, helping engineering organizations improve professional practice and quality management. I started my career in construction, actually in Toronto. Um, I managed first multifamily residential projects and then uh, later institutional sector projects like the um, World Bank uh, System Center and the Mississauga Y that goes way back to the 80s. I moved into um, inside in a leadership position with a national engineering organization uh, where I was their first female VP. I have... Um, also taken on the role over the last two years as the chair of the Canadian Center for Women in Science, Engineering, Trades and Technology, as you've learned earlier, is the uh, Winset Center. And uh, so that's, uh, that's been quite an, an interesting challenge to take on and run my own business at the same time. Thank you. Glad to be here. Delighted to hear what the questions will be and all the answers. Thank you so much, Mark. We are pleased to have you here. Now, this evening, our other panelist is Marissa Sterling. So put your virtual hands together for Marissa. Yay! <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, hi, I'm Marissa Sterling. Uh, I use the pronoun she and her, and I do want to acknowledge that I am joining you from the uh, traditional territories of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Um, I'm just so honored to join the panel tonight, such an esteemed group of colleagues. Uh, I join you wearing a few different hats. Uh, my current career has taken me to the University of Toronto, where I am the Assistant Dean and Director of Diversity, Inclusion, and Professionalism. Very excited to have this role to advance a culture of inclusion, inclusion within the Faculty of Engineering. And I'm also really honored to hold an elected position of President of Professional Engineers of Ontario this year. And that is the organization that licenses um, all of the Ontario, um, engineers in the province of Ontario. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much, Marisa. Really appreciate it. We are lucky to have you here. So let us hear it from our other great panelists this evening. Her name is Lavanya Netrajan. Stage is yours. Hey, everyone. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lavanya. I hold a bachelor degree in science with major in electronics and uh, a master in computer science. Um, basically, I am a software engineer by profession. I have uh, around 20 years of experience in uh, guiding customers and building very robust and um, interesting application to make their life easier. Uh, and also I'm part of many numerous uh, diversity initiatives 
related to women to make sure that they grow and we are able to retain their talent as well. I'm so excited to be here and learn from all of you as well. Thank you so much, Lavanya. Thank you so much. We are very happy to have you here. So let's give a warm welcome to our guest speakers tonight. And the very first one in the list is Rania Hamza. The stage is yours. Um, thank you very much, everyone. And I'm, uh, I'm really happy that I'm here today. Uh, so one minute is a lot. So <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, um, okay, so I'm Rania Hamza and I'm assistant professor at Ryerson University. I'm a civil engineer by training, but actually I'm a construction engineer. I started as a construction engineer, construction management. I did my undergraduate degree in construction management at the American University in Cairo. And then I liked wastewater so much. So I switched to uh, do my master's actually in environmental engineering. And I started by solid waste. And then I, during my PhD, I did wastewater and this is where I am now. And mm -hmm. uh, my other hat, I'm a mother. So um, after we're done with this, you're gonna find me uh, checking if my kids has done the homework or not. <laughs> so I'm very happy uh, to have everybody here. and. One good thing, we're all having Zoom fatigue. And I was like, oh my God, we're gonna have another Zoom, but I'm so happy everybody has the camera on. <laughs> so finally I can see people. <laughs> I guess everybody here can say how tired we are of seeing nobody, black screens speaking to ourselves. So finally we have people. So thank you very much for having people have the cameras on. Very good. Thank you so much. Very lovely to hear from you. And yeah, it seems like my, as I said earlier, my Zoom screen is dancing because everybody have their videos on. So nice to see. So thank you, Rania. Now I would like to invite on this virtual stage, Eli Reza Idraki. The stage is yours. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. I'm thrilled to be part of this uh, great call and uh, event. So my background is I'm an engineer, uh, I'm a system engineer, and uh, I did my MBA in overseas, then joined U of T to do my graduate studies, finish my master's degree in uh, human factors and cognitive engineering. And uh, just recently I graduated from the faculty of law in the University of Toronto, finishing my uh, law degree. Um, in my during my day job, I'm a senior director in Vaftec Electronics. We are uh, providing uh, basically uh, uh, in transit and rail. We are uh, the largest suppliers to the rail industry in North America and worldwide. And we are one of the uh, Fortune 500. Um, I'm uh, I'm happy to be here, and I'm looking forward to join you in our side discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eliza. We are also very happy and lucky to have you here. Thank so you. our next guest speaker for tonight is Linda Kuman. So put your virtual hand together for Linda. Hi, Linda. Oh, that little mute button. There we go. Yes, I was about to say. Probably yes, you got on mute. yes, yes. A pleasure to be with you all. Thank you very much for the invitation to join. I'm going to start by saying I'm a mechanical engineer and also uh, um, have um, background in physics and medical imaging, uh, medical biophysics and 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 medical imaging. Um, but I, I do have to just point out um, that I would like you to edit um, this. I'm no, I'm no longer employed by Trojan Technologies because I am retired and uh, early retirement and I'm still getting used to this even though it's been uh, more th more than uh, almost two years now um, and uh, so so it's a little unusual for me to be in my work clothes at this uh, time of night but I, I took the occasion to actually you know get dressed it feels kind of nice um, anyways um, yes so I was with Trojan Trojan is a uh, London-based um, water treatment company that has uh, some very large installations around the world using UV to disinfect water and um, some new installations going into Toronto in fact and um, 
I was in the role of uh, vice president for a long time in charge of engineering and research in various capacities and, and uh, finally as chief technology officer. So I'm on the panel today to talk about continuing education and uh, certainly that's what life is all about and I look forward to it. Thanks very much. The one thing while I have the soapbox here, I'm delighted to see all the men joining because I think that for women to move forward in society, um, it's about figuring out a new uh, formula to work with men. And uh, so thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. Uh, we appreciate it and we need you. And uh, thanks for being here. Thank you so much, Linda. Thank you so much. And we're happy to see you here and we will make the correction on the slide. Thank you. Um, now on this virtual stage, I will invite Sayed Bishi Bishi. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Julia and everybody. I really appreciate the invitation. I enjoyed a lot. Um, I'm enjoying your energy, actually. You know, I, I can see the energy. So I, I love that mm -hmm. energy. And thank you very much for the opportunity. It's, uh, it's our pleasure to, uh, to be with you here. And uh, when Dr. Adam mentioned to NSERC and MITEX, he took me for a minute going back to... Um, to my journey in Canada. So I came to Canada in 2011. I did my PhD at Western University. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I uh, get benefit from the MITEX program to do a postdoc uh, uh, for my, uh, with MITEX, was Trojan technology, Linda's here. It was a great opportunity to work together. And then I used the NSERC. I got an NSERC PDF did it at Waterloo as well. Mm -hmm. So the great support. So thank you very much for all the support that we are getting from our uh, country here. And then after that, I joined uh, Ryerson University and I'm currently an associate professor at uh, civil engineering at Ryerson University. And I'm also the associate chair for undergraduate uh, program. Mm -hmm. And I'm also the vice president of uh, the Canadian Association on Water Quality, CAWQ. And I'm the governor member of um, IWE and member of uh, Canadian National uh, Committee for uh, CWQ and CWWE. Uh, on the other side, I'm a big fan of soccer. So when there is, you, you choose a good time that it does not conflict with soccer games, so I'm, I'm, I'm here. And also if somebody wants to make a, um, a Bollywood movie night, I'm in. I'm a big fan mm -hmm. of Bollywood. Um, Movies, if anyone wants to make that an Indian movie night, I'm um, without you have the pre permission. Okay, <laughs> good to hear that. Thank you so much for your lovely comments, Sayed, and thank you so much for being here. Um, now I would like to invite on this virtual stage Matthew Davis. So put your virtual hands together for Matthew. <laughs> thank you, thank you, and I, and I really appreciate being uh, invited to this, this wonderful event. Um, like she said, my name is Matthew Davis. I work for the City of Toronto. I'm, a, uh, I'm the manager of the Capital Projects and Program Unit in Transportation Services. And basically what that means is um, we oversee all of the programming, planning, and to a certain degree, installation and delivery of pretty much all of the major infrastructure, transportation infrastructure in Toronto. Um, I have about six groups that are in my unit. Uh, we cover everything from surface transit to active transportation, um, uh, capital coordination. I could, uh, I think transportation safety. I'm trying to remember all of them. Uh, but the most important thing people usually like to know about our units that we control and manage uh, the operating capital budget for transportation services, which is right now uh, half a million, half a billion, excuse me, for capital and, and about 400 some million for operating. So uh, we stay pretty busy. And I, I really appreciate the fact that you all reached out to someone in the public sector to be on a, on a, uh, on a panel such as this and to be a keynote speaker because uh, I think our voices get lost a bit in the shuffle. Uh, there's a lot of esteemed panelists here with uh, very high rankings and very in-depth knowledge in their field. Uh, but in the public sector, we tend to have to be a jack of all trades or a Jill of all trades. So uh, by all means, I, I hope that I can appreciate, uh, sorry, I hope I can show my appreciation by reflecting all of this in our uh, comments and our discussions later. So thank you. Thank you so much, Matthew. We are also looking forward to the discussion. Now I would like to welcome Caroline Tommaso on this virtual stage. Hi, yeah, and thanks so much for having me. This seems like a really great event. So my name is Caroline Di Tommaso. I have a background in chemical engineering and environmental engineering, and I really 
um, found my love of the water and wastewater industry by working in a um, small scale wastewater treatment. Um, and so I decided to specialize in water treatment. And today I work in consulting and I get to uh, solve problems big and small and learn every day by working on yeah, different um, sizes of different projects in the public sector. So that's what I do. Okay, thank you. So good to know about you, Carolyn. Thank you so much. Now on this virtual stage, we are going to invite Akila Srinivasan. Hi, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone for being here. I mean, it's just like um, what he said earlier, it's just amazing energy. Uh, so with that, you know, I'm early on in my career. So to Matthew's point, I see all these amazing accomplished individuals that are high ranking. So I'm building to that. Uh, so uh, my background, I studied at UBC, specializing in the technical field, and I've had an, an eclectic wide range of experience up to this point. And so right now I work at HDR for the tunnel uh, team. And it's really exciting being in a new industry, learning something new every day. Uh, so with that, this is just gonna be a very short and sweet uh, introduction. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you so much, Akila. I really appreciate that. Let's hear it from our other guest speaker tonight, Paige McDonald. Thanks so much. Um, so I am here, you've heard from me already once. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a junior project manager at Electricity Human Resources Canada, one of the happy sponsors of today's event. Um, and I'm a little bit of an oddball on this speaker's panel, to tell you the truth. Uh, I don't have an engineering or a STEM background at all. Um, I'm actually a social science and arts gal. Um, but uh, the programs I'm working on at Electricity Human Resources Canada are all very much focused on uh, youth initiatives and specifically one of them is uh, focused on work integrated learning and co-op and internship opportunities in the sector. Um, so I'm really, really excited to hear about everybody's experience with lifelong learning uh, and talk a little bit about how EHRC sees it fitting with um, some of the activities that we do. Um, so just very grateful to, to Sui and to everybody here for inviting me to participate today. Uh, as, as Matthew expressed, I'm just super grateful to be here. Thank you, thank you so much, Paige. And as I said earlier, we are so lucky to have you all. Thank you. Uh, now on this virtual stage, I would like to invite Gunul Uzidimir. Let's hear it for Gunul. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Shaza. You pronounced my name really good. Thank you. <laughs> I tried. Uh, yes, uh, well, um, my name is Gönül and I am originally from Turkey. Uh, I just moved to Toronto in 2017. So I have my bachelor's degree from Turkey in geological engineering. And uh, so here uh, I work for a geotechnical environmental uh, engineering consulting company. Mm -hmm. And as a field inspector also, I'm in process of getting my PH. And uh, while I was working, also I did my master in uh, engineering from University of Toronto. And uh, it was really stressful and difficult. So this is the reason I, I am here today. So thank you for inviting me. So to talk about working and studying at the same time, I mean, full time, it can be really stressful. So the challenges, I will uh, talk about it. And uh, so I hope you all are doing well in this, uh, during this uh, pandemic because we all are really stressful and tired. Hopefully yeah. uh, we will have uh, our normal life back soon. So I usually work for construction sites. Uh, so I go for foundation, shoring inspection, so for residential and uh, for business uh, projects in Toronto. Uh, so I'm new actually in Toronto, so I'm trying to uh, progress myself. Uh, that's why I went to do my master to, in order to help me to get my PH, uh, you know, and uh, very nice to meet all of you, all these great people. So thank you. Thank you so much, Kunul. So happy to hear from you and looking forward to the, uh, our breakout room discussion. Thank you. So on this virtual stage, we have the last guest speaker for tonight, Sylvie Strachman. Okay. Thanks, Shelda. Hi, everyone. My name is Sylvie. 
I am a PhD candidate at the University of Toronto in my final year. Uh, and I came into academia late. I, I worked in environmental consulting for several years and switched into master's and then a PhD and now just finishing that up. So looking forward to talking to you later and back to you, Shelza. Thank you so much, Sylvie. Thank you so much. I, once again, I would like to welcome everybody virtually. A warm welcome. And now I'm going to turn this virtual mic back to Farooq. Thank you so much uh, for giving me the mic, Shelza. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Now we're officially entering to the first part of our uh, event, which is the moderated this panel discussion. And uh, feel free to turn off your cameras have your dinner and your drinks, okay, while we're talking and giving you great insights about lifelong learning. Okay, uh, now I would like to start this discussion by asking this main and big question, which one of our panelists mentioned before, which is a great question that what is lifelong learning? And I would like to ask uh, Alejandro first to, uh, to let us know what he thinks about this. Thank you, thank you. Well, you know, I think lifelong learning, uh, first of all, is a state of mind of accepting that uh, what you know currently is not enough to carry you successfully uh, through life. And that applies to almost any aspect of what you do, uh, but especially to your career and to your uh, profession. So you really have to be uh, finding ways to assimilate, to incorporate, to adapt uh, new forms of thinking into everything uh, you do. I myself, you know, I, I got my PhD, uh, I guess it was 1986. And if I look at what I've done since I started, since I, uh, I started my career as, as an academic in my case, uh, what I've learned is that I have had to learn a number of new things every step of the way. And that a lot of this learning I have done by working with other people. So reaching out, connecting, networking, and making use of opportunities. In my case, I was fortunate to have a number of postdoctoral opportunities, of opportunities of having uh, great collaborators, and also of traveling abroad and making connections uh, in Europe and other places around the world. And uh, people that I know, family that I know, who work in engineering, what they tell me is that the uh, things progress very quickly. The technologies, folks involved in the computer engineering, that you really have to be up to date in a constant way. So the whole, uh, ment so the mentality, the, the uh, making yourself aware that you have to do that. Now, how you accomplish that, of course, can be a challenge. It depends on your environment. Does your work permit you to do that? Uh, do you have the resources to acquire? Uh, again, going back to school is something I think we're going to talk about, uh, certificates, issues of that kind. But it has to start with the individual, an uh, individual who needs to have that curiosity and that drive to continue learning uh, during their whole journey uh, in this life. Thank you, Alejandra. And then just to add on top of all those challenges, COVID. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, Merrick, uh, what do you think about uh, definition of lifelong learning i am um, i think that it, maybe more so for uh younger people on this panel but i've i've found over the course of my career that even though there's been some constant themes uh about what i've done in my career um the it's changed in what i've had to accomplish what i've been, had to deliver and so I was always looking ahead, you know, what do I need to know to do what I'm doing? What do I need to know to do the next thing I want to do? And when, you know, life throws some curves at you, um, you know, you, you have to think about, well, how am I going to change? You know, how am I going to develop myself? Um, so I've gone from being someone who managed construction to being someone who was in a senior leadership position and now being someone who's delivering consulting services in my own business. And every step along the way, there was so much to learn. I, I also think, though, we, uh, there's something that Alejandro said about curiosity. And, and curiosity is about life and making life a lot more interesting. And I think if we 
we get set in our ways in our career and in our life and we don't allow ourselves to be open and curious and we don't allow ourselves to grow in our skill sets but also as people uh, i think our, our lives become very um very fixed and very uninteresting even you know to ourselves and so i think lifelong learning is an is an attitude of of learning about everything whether it's what you do through work or what you do you know to like i sail and i've learned so much in the last decade about sailing um, that i didn't learn when i was sailing dinghies and that's all exciting and i think it's just looking at everything you do in your life and in your career and and continuing to learn all along the way Thank you very much, uh, Mark. Very, very absolute great points. And I want to hear now from Lavinia. That what do you think, Lavinia, about the lifelong learning? Yeah. Um, I believe that uh, lifelong learning is uh, not just about learning, but it's also having that kind of growth mindset, right? So you want to actually grow uh, exponentially. So when I look at growth, I want to look at it from three dimensions, right? I think we have to mentally grow stronger, one dimension. The second uh, dimension you want to see is the physically how you're growing up and as really intellectually. So every day, how much you're putting in to grow intellectually is a very important question, right? So with what Arjan Roo said, mentioned once, there's a quote that I earned, learned in my early high school. It actually says that, what you have learned in life only always measures to a sand that you can hold in your fist. And what you have to learn is actually big as the world. So I think there must be, when you take this quote, you're, it humbles you down saying that there is so much to learn and the whole world is still there to go learn and grow, right? One thing that I want to talk, which is very relevant to today's generation is that not only we need to learn, but we need to unlearn certain things that we have learned. The world is changing so much that sometimes what you re read or learned 10 years back may not be valid or it has evolved so much that it ha gets hard to keep up, right? So I think learning is also about going, looking, unlearning some things that you've learned. I think that's the very valid um, statement for today's world. Um, so that's what lifelong learning means to me. Yeah. Thank you very much, Lavinia. Just on the part of uh, unlearning, I wanted to mention that this is the toughest thing. I, when I came to Canada, I, I used to do defense driving back home and then unlearning my defense driving and learning how to drive safely was such a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Lavinia. Uh, Marissa, I want to hear from you. What, uh, what do you think about lifelong learning? Yeah, thanks very much. Um, so obviously phenomenal uh, comments already being shared by the group here, you know, asking questions, being inquisitive. Uh, we heard about resilience and I love the comment around unlearning. I'll just quickly share with you um, as our country goes through reconciliation with indigenous people, in fact, we are unlearning. And um, I'm, I'm saddened every day to think about the history I was given uh, in my education, in my public school education up until grade 12, uh, that I need to unlearn because in fact, it was completely void of indigenous uh, history in Canada. So that's just a really relevant current um, situation that we're facing and realization on the unlearning. So I love that that was said. What can I add? I can add to that maybe a couple more things. Um, one is maybe humility. And uh, you know, I point to this, uh, this iron ring that some of us may hold. And part of when um, the iron ring is received and the commitment is sort of made, um, a, a, a big foundational part of it is, is humility, recognizing that we don't know what we don't know, right? And we don't, we don't know very much. And we have to always be asking to fully understand because we're trying to understand the natural world around us that we know that we're constantly learning. Um, so I'll just share with you a, a couple of interesting uh, quick stories just to parallel what I'm thinking about lifelong learning. One is that uh, there's a bus that's moving very quickly, uh, which is the world, which is um, knowledge. And we can either run behind it, kind of hold on to it and let it sort of, um, drag our, our toes or we can get on it and kind of go with it. So I think lifelong learning is staying on that bus 
um, and, and keeping ourselves up to date because everything is changing around us. So we can't really stop that change. The other thing I love about those said to is about resilience. And I'm just going to share with you a quick story that I'm so proud to have my mother and my sister listening on this call. And they're amazing examples of resilience because you've got my mom who has taught herself during COVID all of this digital technology. She's the one telling her friends how to Zoom and she's uh, the one telling me how to message and everything else. And then I've got my sister who has uh, set up her home now with um, some cameras, some lights, extra uh, equipment and stuff. And so she can deliver workshops for, for, for kids in school. So, I mean, those are great examples of that lifelong learning. And I think that the, uh, the ability to say, uh, how can I maximize where I am right now? How can I be aware of what's happening around me? And how do I not just keep up, but stay ahead of the curve? I think that's lifelong learning. Thank you very much, Marissa. I really, really loved about your story about your your mother, and I totally agree that my mother does the same. <laughs> I I I, uh, I guess that everyone's mothers are the same boat <laughs> tonight, <laughs> with so much thing to learn with this pandemic. Okay, great. Now, uh, given all these great definitions, I I want to go to my next question for you. Uh, listening to you about your opinion about going back to school after long period of working in industry. And I, I think you guys are the best to comment on this since you have been in industry for a while. Um, I would like to uh, uh, hear from Merrick first. Uh, <clears throat> I haven't been, what I would say, back to school in a long time, but over the course of my career, a couple of things do come to mind. I was about I, five, six, seven, eight years out of school and I decided that I would go back and I would take a, a degree, a master's degree in construction management. Um, I worked all day outside, went in um, you know, and tried to take courses at night, found myself sitting in a room with a lot of people who'd come through school from their first degree and got into their second degree and so they were all geared up and they knew how to sit in a class and learn that way. They hadn't lost um, some of that ability. And I really, I really found that very hard to sit there and, and uh, be able to, to learn. A couple of times during the course of my career, I've also taken um, you know, sort of four or five day um, uh, workshops with an actual exam at the end. And it had probably been 20 years since I'd written an exam that was timed with, uh, you know, with everything going on and that, but it was, it was such a, I, I took pride in the fact that I, I had learned in the four days or the five days I was in these things and I wrote the exam and I did really well on it. And it, it just gave back some of that excitement about being back at school. I always loved to learn and I love to achieve and I love to, you know, do well on, on exams. But I, I guess the, the thing I would say is that um, when I've gone back to do these things, they've made a difference in where my career took me after them. Uh, they both, they shaped what was ahead by going back and taking something new and, and taking it in a very formal way, as opposed to, you know, some of the, um, you know, the seminars or the talks or the things we do along the way to educate ourselves. These were, these were big, steps that changed the course of my career. Thank you very much for sharing that. I, I love uh, the, the workshop and being in those big teams. Thank you so much, Mark, for sharing that. Um, uh, Alejandra, how about your opinion about going back to school suddenly yes. from work? <laughs> well, I can, I can um, I think first of all, we have to define what going back to school means currently. Right? Does it mean going back to get a, a master's or a PhD? Or does it mean going back to get a certificate, a shorter term degree? You know, there's a, a, a long term, like a PhD or master. Yeah, but, but, the, but I mean, I think that's one of the discussions that is going on. What, what is most suitable for uh, people in terms of their lifestyle, in terms of this dynamic learning, right? So, so uh, uh, do, do you want to have to sit for three or four years learning something which you could, uh, the core of which could be learned perhaps in a year or in six months. And then two or three years later, you go back and learn again for, for six months. So, so I think that's, that's a fundamental question about going back. Now, I myself 
have not worked in industry, but I have taught people in industry. And uh, uh, I'll tell you uh, my experience with that is when I was teaching at Stanford. And as you know, you guys know, they have a wonderful engineering program there. And uh, I would teach a course that was uh, beamed a video by video to the companies in Silicon Valley. And every facility was given to those people in those companies to learn. I was teaching linear algebra, a subject which I hope all of you love. And, uh, and I was very impressed by how Stanford set everything up so that you know the, the timing, the homework, there was couriers that would take the homework back and forth. There was the connections where the students could ask questions. And I, might, I could videotape some of the classes in advance. So uh, there was really reaching out to that community of most of the engineers working in Silicon Valley and a number of companies so that they can continue their education and get this kind of high level, sophisticated engineering science skills that is required in the high tech sector. So I think uh, that kind of, of approach that university, if they can do that, adapted to the particular uh, circumstance, I think that's key because uh, people who work, uh, they have certain barriers. It's different than the, the ordinary uh, student uh, or the, the what we call the, um, the model of the undergraduate that has a lot of extra time. So I think it's important that universities think outside the box. And of course, this changes as, as things evolve. Thank you very much, Alejandra. Uh, regarding the linear al algebra, I just wanted to mention that I, I believe most people in this room, that they love that because they, they chose engineering. <laughs> Okay, I, I can speak for them for at least 90%. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, uh, Marissa, what do you think about going back to school? Sure. So my short answer is I don't think there's one path, you know, and everyone will have a very unique um, career. And uh, I think back to the class of 1935 at the University of Toronto Engineering. And that class um, is known for creating an award called the Second Mile Engineer Award. And that award was about kind of going beyond obviously like an undergraduate program. And if you look at people who won that award, then how they've gone beyond kind of uh, into their careers and, and so forth. And if, if in 1935, <laughs> that, that was on the minds of those um, students, then it just shows how um, there was, you know, already a lot of thinking about there's not one pathway and there's multiple ways and how do you kind of go beyond what um, and, and think of alternatives, I guess. And um, so, I, so just on this particular question about uh, industry and back to school, um, I may be sort of in that camp in that I spent about 20 years in industry. So my first job was at Procter & Gamble and I stayed in the consumer packaged goods industry. Uh, working in research and then I moved into um, uh, technical sales and then eventually into, uh, into marketing. And uh, that industry experience was phenomenal for me. Uh, wonderful training and leadership that you get, very organized in companies, particularly large companies. It's very, very structured and um, uh, at the right times in your career. So it's a super wonderful experience. Um, and, uh, but then when I got the chance to come into the academic world, uh, what that has offered is um, a really great opportunity for a different type of critical thinking that you may not have in industry if, you know, your goal is really clear, right? And so you're kind of focused in that one place. But then when you get a chance to um, go back to, back to, to education or in academia, your world kind of opens up in terms of, you um, uh, the scope of what you can be thinking about, who you can be working with and partnering with. And, uh, um, and I think that that is really interesting. And so my, my conclusion to, to, to this thought is that for many, potentially for many people, particularly when you're going through an undergrad degree, is in a lot of cases, you're, you're just trying to get the mark and survive, right? And in a lot of cases, with engineering, it's a very intense program. And so you know, you're, you're moving quickly and you're just like, what do I need to know to get through this course, right? And it may, depending on how you're going through it and the timing of how you're going through it, you may not get a chance to fully um, embrace the material because you're also taking a lot of material to figure out which one you like. Like, even if you're like on chemical engineering, if, you, if you're studying one area, there's so many branches. And I think that if, you, if you're spending time at a graduate level, master's PhD or in, in certificate programs and so forth, 
you're not even getting more specialized and you're able to focus on that and you're likely choosing it and your educational experience could be a little bit different because now you're really there to learn. Um, and uh, maybe sometimes you're only there to survive, right? In your earlier degrees. And so I think that the experience can be very different. And, um, and so I think there can be some really great richness from uh, doing further learning uh, because you're choosing it and you're spending time on it and you're focusing in areas that you really are interested in. Uh, very, very great points, Marisa. I can't agree more. <laughs> Thank you so much. Lavinia, now, what do you think? Yeah. Um, so when I hear this question, right, I'm like, why don't we actually do it? We are supposed to do it that way, right? Um, it's the, one of the best things that you can do for yourself, right? So what I have seen is that um, what I've seen is that when you work in industries for a longer time, what happens is a kind of silo thinking comes in. There is a there is a group of people who are working together, and we see that. Um, the kind of thinking gets into a bucket kind of situation or it's blocked. So I think coming out of that and staying out of it or taking some time off and reading and going back gives you a new perspective to the whole thing that you're bringing to the table. Um, so this is what I've been, I have not been able to take long breaks, which I wish to take. But what I have done consistently is take 10 days, five days, go back and then you, your perspective learning and bringing that new value back to your work is going to be amazing experience um, so you must do it all of us must do it <laughs> okay thank you very much Lavinia great points and uh, now building on what uh, all of you said um, there were rumors and people said that um, for engineers it's bachelor's enough or some some people said um, why to do master if you wanna you wanna do the you know industry you can go with your bachelor or some people say especially to myself why you're going to PhD you get overqualified you cannot get hired here and there so there are all these rumors around about uh, what level of education is good for engineer no that's the definition of good so I I wanted to ask this question that what do you think where should we stop <laughs> I would like to refer this first to Lavinia. <laughs> yeah. So uh, this is a very good question and very valid question, right? I want to talk about a basic education is very much required to get a seat at a at a table for an opportunity, right? But uh, coming from software background, I would say that this has been changing with time. People have started looking beyond degrees. And when I look at an engineer, right, I think it's a mindset. You engineer will be put anywhere and he'll be a, he or she will be an engineer. They are curious, they are thinking how to solve problems, how to make life easier. So I think it's it's very important. But now saying that, do we say a specialization or a PhD, what value it brings? For sure, it brings a lot of value, right? Because you are a specialist in a particular thing. If I want to go and be creative and innovative in a particular area, it is a PhD that is going to give you to look through end-to-end -end solution, right? But we would not want to limit ourselves to that. We want to also be um, a generalist as well around things around your field. So what I've seen is, for example, in software, we do specialize in one thing. I did specialization for many years, but the value add actually comes in when you have a breadth of experience where you can bring different things together and put it together, right? For example, I would say one of the basic concepts in electronics like circuit breaker, it says that fail first. Uh, concept is actually bought into software engineering design because we are all building systems and sometimes um, experience from one bucket is very valid for something that we are learning. So I believe that not only being a specialist, but also have be having that attitude of being a generalist will bring you a lot of value add. So PhD, go for it, but do stay um, active in learning about the other things as well that's around it. Very great advice, Lavinia. I loved about this the fact that we should stay um, informed about the, the general and knowledge as well. Yeah. Thank you. Amerik, what do you think about all the master PhD stuff? I, I think I'd come back to what it is you want out of your career. I, I think it, coming from um, past years inside a, a consulting engineering company, if you're looking to be an expert in um, 
you know, in a particular field of engineering or practice area, there's a lot of value in going through and getting a master's or getting a PhD um, in, in that specialization. And so it's, is that the route you want to go? Are you more inclined to want to go up the, the ladder through leadership roles? Maybe there's other forms of education, whether that, I mean, yes, there are MBAs and business uh, degrees that get you there, but there's also um, certificate programs or one week executive learning programs that, you know, can help in that area. So I, I think it's, it's not just a matter, is it, is it good or bad? It's what do you want to do and how will this help you? And um, does it make sense at this time in your career to go back and, and take uh, a degree? I mean, there's time involved, there's money involved. Um, and you, you know, where are you in, your, in the rest of your life? Does it fit with that as well as does it fit with your career? Thank you very much, Mark. I think your answer relieved so many master and PhD students in this room. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you very much. And I wanna hear now from Alejandra. I do, I do wanna correct that even though I, I love to be called Alejandra, uh, it's Alejandro. Oh, well, I'm so I, I, I would, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I that's fine. That would name Sounds it. beautiful. I do have a cousin called Alejandra Adam. So, but, uh, but anyway. Um, Thanks for correcting me. I, I, well, I want to say, first of all, uh, of course, uh, there are some engineering PhDs who are among the top uh, scientists in Canada, right? And, you know, in particular, uh, the winner of the Herzberg Gold Medal this year, that the top science prize in Canada was the, uh, Dr. Molly Choiquet from the University of Toronto, uh, leading the way, biomedical engineering. So you guys, when you guys do your PhD and the, the sky's the limit, right? And I knew some electrical engineers in, at the Stanford that were telling us mathematicians what we should be doing. So uh, don't, don't, don't um, sell yourself short on the academic side, obviously. Now, if we're talking about industry, more practical issues, uh, I, I think one of the problems is that people sometimes think they have to first do a master's and then do a PhD. And the, and the programs uh, in Canada are mostly set up that way. Um, in other parts, like in the United States, you usually choose a path. You can go straight into a PhD from an undergraduate degree. And um, so it's, it's about your inclination. You can do a master's along the way. So uh, it's really about time and what you see yourself doing. Now, uh, I'll give you an example of my wife, for example. She did a degree, a master's degree in industrial engineering at Stanford. And it was like 12 months, super intense work with case studies, working with industry. And then a uh, month after graduating, she gets a job at a company right there in, in the Stanford area, right? It was designed to create graduates who were useful for the companies around there. And of course, the founder of the company uh, had previously been a professor at Stanford and so forth and so on. So there are, there are uh, uh, ways and programs I think it's a question about what program you're getting into. What are the, the outcomes? Look at what where are these students they've had, where are they now, right? And ask around uh, in terms of what is practical, what has worked and uh, what the successes have been. So you have to keep it two minds. Now, if you do a PhD in a practical way and then get deeply embedded in industry, you can actually be hugely successful as a business person because of that technical knowledge. And a lot of the high tech stuff, I know, for example, Linda, who's here, right? And I didn't meet her in my time at my text. Hello, Linda. Hello. Ooh, those guys Hello, are doing Andrew. high level, high level science, right? So you didn't know everything you needed to know. It, 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 I think you needed several PhDs to understand what they were doing. So yeah. it, it really depends on, on the industry uh, you're working in. Can I, can I comment on this, uh, Farouk and Alejandro? Do you mind? Please. Absolutely. Um, yeah, because I, I um, did my PhD in mechanical engineering at the University of Toronto. It wasn't in biomedical engineering because, because that way I could avoid taking a few courses in physiology and anatomy that I really didn't want to take. Um, but it was biomedical engineering. And, and actually, I studied hyaluronic acid and the, um, um, the rate at which it diffuses. And so the uh, diffusion coefficients I measured of hyaluronic acid. Now you might ask yourself, what does that have to do with treating water uh, with ultraviolet light? And the answer is absolutely nothing. 
um, and but everything um, because a PhD is actually it's it's about a methodology it's about a way of thinking and so when someone says to me I'm really on the cusp of trying to decide whether I should do a PhD or not I sit down and tell them they shouldn't um, and if at the end of it I haven't convinced them then they should and that's the test um, because it's a massive investment it's a massive investment of your time of your life um, for women we haven't figured out yet how to um, accommodate women in academe so that the, the best time when you should be raising a family, um, you're, you're compromising your health out of your child perhaps, um, because you're delaying having a child oftentimes, it's actually not smart um, from a physiological or social perspective in my, in my opinion. And so we just kind of haven't figured it out. It's a huge investment. And so, you know, do you want to, do you want to make that? Um, the return on your investment fiscally is actually also really not very good most of the time, unless you happen to end up in an executive position, um, which, which doesn't happen to most people, frankly. Um, but um, if you do decide to do it, um, the, the world can be open. And one, the leadership that Alejandro provided in Canada that was unique, uh, unique in the world actually, was to, was to bridge that, um, to bridge that chasm between academe, which is very focused, and between the generalism that um, Marg and Marissa, you have spoken to needing, um, because you, you do need to have the generalism in industry, you need to have the general view in order to figure out what it is that's specific enough that you can then go and let to people like Alejandro and say, can you solve this problem for me? But you really need to be smart enough to figure out what this problem is. And for that, you need a broader view. And so what we were able to do in our company was we had about 15 PhDs all of different backgrounds. And so the, the information that comes to you in industry is like drinking from a fire hose. It's massive. You, you cannot possibly keep up to date with it. And so really the, one of the main tools in your toolbox for keeping yourself educated to even know what it is that you should know is to have the right co collaborators at the table with you. Um, and so I would say, do you want to do a master's or a PhD? It's not so much a career question as it is, you know, what's in your heart, what's in your gut, because you have to be curious. It's a huge investment. Thank you need you. to have insight and inspiration. And it's too long. I'm taking too much time. Sorry. No, don't worry. Thank you so much, Linda. It was really absolute, very valuable uh, insights. Uh, thank you so much. Um, Marissa, what do you think? Sure, thanks very much. Um, you know, really, totally agree with a lot of what's been said. Um, I'll just highlight a few things I've heard. So one is quality of life. I do think we have to have hard, um, uh, a hard uh, moment of reflection uh, for ourselves about what we want in our holistic life. Um, because it is, it is real in terms of balancing what you like to do in terms of um, any kind of family, care, taking care of loved ones, um, and what you'd like to do in your career. And maybe you like other things. Maybe you're also, you know, are an active, active in sports, or you have other, other sides of you and you're an artist, right? So I think it is important to take that holistic view and, and, and to um, give yourself, um, you know, honor that in yourself, right? Because you are that whole person. And I, I totally do believe there are trade-offs I will challenge. I don't believe we can do it all. I mean, we, we, we've heard that that is a, a movement. Um, it is a movement of, uh, of change, which is great and um, an opportunity, but I think it's also not realistic. And I think that you do have to make hard decisions with looking at your values and then deciding what's the right thing for you as a whole person um, in terms of like the minimum. So uh, if I look, if I put my hat on from the licensing body of, of, an, of engineers in Ontario, but it's the same across Canada, a bachelor's degree is the minimum educational requirement. And so with a bachelor's level degree and appropriate work experience, um, it has been determined that you have sufficient knowledge to uh, become a licensed engineer, certainly if you're an accredited program in Canada, um, from which to start from, right? Because of course, you're going to have to keep uh, learning and growing your field. So definitely, a, so definitely a bachelor's degree is, is enough, right? Not that it, it needs to be it, but it, it is enough. 
So I think that good reflection on who you are, what you want in your whole life is a big part of the question. Um, and I think uh, what was also said earlier about uh, looking at industry uh, role models, like an industry wants, right? So industry would be looking for different things. And, and so to look at, well, I would love to be in this role. What are the pathways that people got there? And therefore, what could I, uh, how can I bring my background to sort of get to that place where I can be seen as someone to, to be in the role? The thing is that in most cases, we're completely competent for like a ton of roles. It's whether those that have the roles that are want that, that you know we have to convince them that we would like these roles and this is why, right? So that's uh, in most cases the dynamic of what's happening. But I'll just end with a very funny story in that in my career I decided I wanted to uh, try to become a politician, and so I uh, went to one of the political, political parties to say I was very interested in running uh, to be a provincial politician, and I did, had no idea how to do it, so I brought my resume. And I went through my knowledge and experience. And I said, is this enough? Do I qualify to be a politician? Well, I have to tell you, I mean, I was so naive. They laughed at me because the only qualifications for a politician is you have to be 18 years old. <laughs> That's about <laughs> it. Right? And so, but the mindset was, you know, do I have the skills for this, this position, for this job, what's necessary, right? That's the mindset we have in industry and in academia about can't we, do we have it? So I'm just giving it as a funny example in terms of lots of people successfully, for example, become politicians with a variety of different resumes. And so you can likely do a lot of jobs as well. There's many ways of showing that you've got that. And um, it's maybe a bit more so about really deciding what it is that you'd love to do look at some of the pathways of people that have come into those roles and then decide for your personal situation, what is the mix that's going to be work for you? And then how do you present that in order to get that career that you're looking for? So. Thank you so much, Marissa. I, I want to have a follow-up question for you uh, because you mentioned about uh, the polit politics and uh, you know that, that's where I'm, I'm so interested. So let's say that we got this engineering degree bachelor, master, PhD, whatever. So you have an engineering degree. What about other degrees? Do we need it? Is it recommended? Or what, like law degree, MBA degree, max degree? What yeah. do you think about this? I, I mean, uh, short answer is yes. I mean, I would say yes to all in terms of there's so many interesting combinations and there's so many in interesting intersections, right? So engineering, for example, even within itself has great intersections. And we've seen it from some of the people introducing themselves tonight. They studied in one area, um, uh, you know, uh, um, got a um, specialty in another and they're kind of combining, right? So that's, that's one thing. Their engineering um, programs are not silos in themselves. They're very, very much interlinked. But, you know, I know uh, patent lawyers, right? Who have engineering degrees and law degrees. And then they work on, um, uh, they work in the patent field, right? And they might own their own business doing that as well. So they're entrepreneurs, lawyers, patent lawyers, engineers, right? So that's like an interesting combination. Um, I mean, look at the need in healthcare with COVID, right? So there's definitely going to be people with medical and um, engineering backgrounds playing a role not just now in the pandemic, but it, but in the bio, that biomedical field, right? So um, I think they're all great and, and there isn't a combination that isn't great. We had, I think a social scientist introduce themselves tonight on the call and was kind of saying, you know, I'm not really in this world. Well, in fact, the social scientists who have become interested in engineering in the last 10, 15 years are the ones that have elevated the research around the biases in engineering and the challenges we have with marginalized communities and how we overcome them. So in fact, if you had a social science and an engineering background, you know that might bring about some really exciting uh, further observations about some of the real systemic uh, issues we still have in our profession. So I can't see any combination um, not being a great combination. And I think that the mindset of always saying yes and is a great growth mindset to have, but I do think it has to be driven from our passion. Like if, we, if we're not loving it, we're probably not gonna enjoy the experience. So I think it, as long as it links with your passion, then, you know, then, you're, then you're good to go. 
Thank you very much, Marissa. Very, very valid point. Lavinia, what do you think about these other degree for engineers? Uh, uh, so I would talk about uh, like on my personal experience as well on this one. This is very, very um, close to my heart, actually. So when I started uh, studying for my bachelor degree, I actually decided to do my bachelor's in electronics. And parallelly, I used to study for um, in computer science. And after that, I did my master's. So the goal was, as everybody said, uh, it actually aligns to your goal and your passion. I always wanted to do problem solve um, using computers and software in electronic industry. So it was very interesting that once I was day out, I was able to do a lot of work in um, mining industry, let it be uh, electronic industry, uh, we're connecting to devices, making it work. I even had to go work with industries in the car industry. So I think it's a, it's a very good blend it's a very good blend that you cannot imagine what value add you can bring when two industries uh, that you learn and merge. Um, uh, it, it is a big pathway for, uh, for innovation. If you're an engineer and you have that mindset and it's something that you want to solve, then that's a great place to be in where you actually learn uh, two different things. So this is a very common thing in IT. We actually do this every time the project change. So last year I had to read a lot on investment banking and securitization and so forth and so on, right? So I think um, as somebody mentioned as well prior that it is a very good thing to do. You must think about it, but it must align about all about your passion, right? Um, every dream that is worth pursuing uh, is actually a craziness, right? It's a passion that is beyond, uh, beyond uh, a normal level of thing. So I think um, it, it is a very uh, interesting thing that you can bring for sure, yeah. Thank you very much, Lavinia. Very, very uh, fantastic uh, points there. Marek, I want to hear from you. What do you think about these different degrees? Um, I'm, a, I'm a little torn in this, and I'll, I'll say why. I, I do think that um, any, uh, a, any degree in a different area like law or medicine or uh, social science or um, you know any of those degrees, if you've got that base in engineering, you strengthen what you bring to that next career. What um, I think we've talked about following your passion and, and you know deciding what you do because of that. And I think that unfortunately, a lot of women enter workplaces, industry sectors that they've found not welcoming, like engineering in various places hasn't been. And so that choice is made um, almost like giving up the dream and following another route. And, and so that's what I'm torn about because I, I mean, I love it if you decide that you're gonna combine those, it's something you wanna do and you're doing it because of your passion. But if you're doing it because it's, I, I, you know, I, I, this is not the place for me. It's not, it's not a welcome environment. Then, that, then that's unfortunate. So that's why I'm a bit torn by that question. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Merrick, for uh, for expressing your valuable opinion. Uh, Alejandra, what do you think about this? Alejandro, Alejandro. <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> I'm hungry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Uh, the, um, well, you know, I, I also have a kind of mixed opinions about this one, you know, uh, it depends a lot on the individual, you know, you're kind of stacking knowledge on one individual and then they can integrate it to become a more wholesome, holistic in how they approach problem solving. On the other hand, uh, one thing we've learned in modern society is that you can also build it like this by creating teams. So if you can have a, a, a strong team with a, say an MBA or a person in the arts or depending on what pro program project you're working on, uh, that, you know, I, I always like to say when I, when I, um, I like to have collaborators that know what I don't know. And say, well, you're my brain for that. And uh, working with them, having them on a team, uh, I find, um, very exciting and very and of course i can turn it on and off also and it's less of a, of a personal burden on myself and what we see then is the power of interdisciplinary collaboration so and that doesn't mean you have to be fully yourself but you can spread it out with, with the team so i would just want to put that out there as, as an alternative to stacking up degrees thank you very much alejandro <laughs> 
Okay. Um, well, there's a lot of question in my head to ask, but just the time is so short and limited for us to go through all these questions that, that we have. But the good thing is that we can go to the breakout rooms and talk more about the points that I couldn't tackle during this discussion. Um, by this, I would like to uh, just really, really thank all my four panelists for the great opinions. I really, really enjoyed and, and learned personally a lot. And I'm sure everyone in this room uh, got in, inspired and learned a lot from what you mentioned and all your ideas. Please give a big round of applause for all our panelists. Thank you so much. Okay, let me share my screen again. Now, between my tons of screen, I, I think I found it. Did I? Or no? <laughs> okay, I think I found it. Do you see my the presentation? Yes. Okay. So now this is the time for the second part of our uh, events where we will split into the breakout rooms. Whoever has a question for our grade four panelists can stay in the main room to answer uh, to ask their questions. Well, all the other people can go to the breakout rooms, to any breakout rooms that they choose. You can pick any breakout room and uh, that interests you or the, the topic is uh, interesting for you and you can join that. OK, so imagine now the, the door is open. You can go to the hallway, choose any room that you want to do. OK, <laughs> OK, great. Um, Julia, where are you? Can I hear you, Julia? Hello? Where, where is everyone here? <laughs> oh, there, yeah, there you go. Okay, if you had any help, here's Julia. Okay, just uh, make sure you recognize her face so you can uh, just uh, um, ask her for the help. Okay, so we're gonna open the breakout rooms now. And again, as I said, uh, you are allowed to go to any room that you want. So pick your breakout rooms and go there. Um, we will have two great panelists in each room who will be talking to you more about this in the special topics. And again, if you have any question, you can stay in the main room and ask our four panelists on the questions that you might have, okay? Okay, I'll give it probably couple of seconds. I think everyone is now expert in Zoom. So 30 seconds will be enough for everyone to go to the breakout rooms. <laughs> okay. Oh. I can see people are going to the breakout rooms. Oh, yeah, our uh, honored speakers, please make sure that you join the breakout rooms. <laughs> the most important one. Okay, great. I can see that now people are reading and 30 seconds is almost over too. Okay. Um, where is Jano? Jano, can I see you around? Okay, I can't see Janel. <laughs> then, then I'll start with taking the question. Janel was supposed to take over my role cause, so I can eat a little bit and drink water, but I'm going to take her role. <laughs> okay. Uh, I would like to. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> I would like to open the floor for the questions now. Please feel free to ask your question by just turning off your mic and just raising your hand and you can talk or you can type it into the chat and I can read it loud for you. Just any, any way you feel comfortable with, okay? Let me go to the chat. How do I go to the breakout room? Oh, that's not a question. <laughs> okay, so please feel free to, uh, uh, unmute yourself and ask any question if you had or type it into the chat. Hey, that was that was my question. Like, I don't know, I don't usually use Zoom. Oh, th okay. Oh. Some question. <laughs> no, no, if you go down to your menu at the bottom, you'll see something that says breakout room or if you're on a desktop. I'm on a laptop. See that option? Nope. You're on a laptop? Yeah, so if you're on a laptop, that's okay. Um, you should see a button at the very bottom of a full screen um, that says breakout rooms and you can select that and then you, I think you'll have the option to 
select one of the um, many options. You might have to scroll to the very bottom of the participants tab. Does that make sense? Okay, thanks. Awesome. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, if uh, everyone is thinking about their question, I have a couple of questions that I haven't asked <laughs> the panelists, and I would love to ask that while everyone is uh, thinking. Um, my question was about the, the certification that, because we talked about these long-term education and uh, having master or PhD or other degree, but we didn't really talk about uh, the small courses or certification that you need. There. I, I, or the for the licenses that you might need. I, I would like to hear first from Marissa. What do you think, Marissa, about this? Sure. Do you mind just uh, receiving your question? You said about the licenses, and I yes. Uh, so your question, yeah. For example, uh, for some of the, the positions in the industries, it's mandatory to have EIT or PNG, okay. uh, and uh, and it costs. And what what should people really do it? Should they go there in their early career, think about it, or something that can do later? So what's your opinion towards getting that certification first? And also, will they are uh, in the job workforce taking certificates, small certificates, or joining um, small courses, taking certificates for that? What's your opinion around that? Sure. Um, so I'll give you my uh, opinion first about getting a PNG license, and I will uh, be very clear that I'm I'm likely very biased. <laughs> but um, uh, but here here's something to think about. Um, when you decide to undertake an engineering degree, uh, you've chosen to take a, take a professional degree, right? And a professional degree means that it um, provides you one of the criteria, the educational criteria for a licensed profession. And a licensed profession is a unique place in society because you hold um, additional accountability than a non-licensed profession. So it's not about one being better than the other. It's the fact that society um, establishes certain professions as having an extra level of accountability to the public. So for example, your Dentist, you know, is a, a, is a licensed profession, and that's great because we don't have to look up the credentials and get sort of comments and reviews on the dentist. We can just go trust them and make sure that and we're going to have a good experience. So the honor when you take an engineering degree, the honor is uh, to be able to become one of these accountable licensed professions in Canada. And and I I think it's a great honor. I think that it can open up a lot of doors for you. And I think that the best way to get it, the best pathway is right after your education. So in order to, and it's just, it's the same. If you were, you know, going to be a lawyer, you, you go to law school and then you article, you know, and like, it's all, it's all connected, right? You don't sort of take it and then think about it for a while, then go back and article. It's usually, it's usually one after the other. So I highly recommend doing that because, because the engineering degree is so, can go in so many ways. And we've already talked about the breadth of um, careers people can have and uh, further specialties. Likely you are gonna migrate to some area that's gonna be your interest. And so as you migrate, you may less and less um, have uh, some of that really core engineering background that requires a license. And so my sincere recommendation, potentially not biased, but my sincere recommendation is that people pursuing an engineering degree, take those extra couple of years to uh, get, get experience and get the license. Because once you have the license, then we talk about education. So in the licensed profession, um, having what's called continuing professional development, CPD, is very common for uh, licensed professions. And it's something right now that Ontario, the engineering Ontario regulator is thinking about how exactly to do this. and that comes to your lifelong learning. So you'll always be keeping yourself current, right? You'll drive that and, and you'll likely do that anyways. Um, uh, but that hurdle of being able to be that licensed profession gets potentially more difficult over time. And so, you know, cause your education, someone else said earlier, your education gets stale, right? The knowledge keeps changing. That maybe isn't as current anymore. 
So I do, I do highly recommend that people go through and get the license because once you can become the engineer, an engineering graduate and engineer are two different things. When you can become the engineer, you never know that's going to be valuable. And there, some companies will say, this is great. So when I worked in sales, they said, oh, this is great. I've never had an engineer work in technical sales, but this is wonderful because I can trust you. You know, you have an accountability to the public. You have a code of ethics. I have this additional layer that I feel um, that I can uh, entrust to you because I know that you have these responsibilities. So that's my sort of two cents about that certification. Um, and then I know you're talking about all other kinds, right? Certificates and other things that you can do. But let me just finish by just talking about that piece which is the license certification. Sure, thank you so much, Marisa. Absolutely great points. And uh, uh, just representing that body of uh, professional engineers, I think you really made a great point for all of us. Thank you very much. Uh, Mark, what do you think? Oh, you're muted. I was going to comment <laughs> on the, um, uh, on these, on the other types of, uh, you know, the kind of the seminars, the webinars, all those things. But I, I do want to make some comments uh, about what Marissa was saying. I, I think getting that um, that PN right out of university, it, it is important because you're technically sound and probably, you know, and uh, as sound broadly as you'll you'll ever be. But the other part of it is it's also this base. Marissa mentioned about the code of ethics and the, it, it um, I mean, that's a really important part of being a professional is that there, there is a code of ethics, there's a duty that goes with it. And so getting that foundation early in your career by getting that professional designation and understanding what it means to be a professional, I, I think is extremely important. So anyone coming out of school, don't wait, go through the, the process, work very hard to get it. And like Marissa, I'm a little biased there as well. I uh, do a lot of work for engineers and geoscientists BC. And uh, so I have a great appreciation for the designations. I, I think on the um, on the other side of it, I, I mean, I for those sort of those seminars, those webinars, those small pieces, those nuggets of knowledge. I mean, over the course of my career, I have found those to be very valuable, and I highly recommend them. I've got uh, you know a couple of certifications, a couple of designations, and all of those came later after the degree, after the PNG. Um, and they've added to kind of depth and expertise to uh, my ability to do things. And so I think that's, uh, that's a great way to go. And especially, you know, you say, well, can you do a master's degree and you have to consider the financial side of it? A lot of these other things are, are things that you can do. The time isn't, isn't going to take you, uh, you know, for a long time away from your family and your career and, and the cost is not going to be overwhelming. So they, they are a good positive thing to do. And if I could throw in another little piece and it hasn't come up in the questions, it's, it's around uh, what you do in your practice. Um, if somebody offers you an opportunity to take on something and you go, oh, that, that looks impossible, take it. Um, you will learn so much from taking on those big challenges. And I, I would probably say that some of my best learning has come from taking on something where another one of my colleagues, a leader, actually senior, more senior than me in the company said, oh, that's a career killer um, if it doesn't work out. But boy, if it works out, it opens the door. So um, my, uh, my CEO used to call them impossible missions. And whatever my nature is, I mean, somebody offers me an impossible mission. I'm excited. I think that's just a great challenge and I want to take it on. And I learn lots. Oh, wow. I, I love the impossible challenge and taking the risk for them. Yeah, that is so true. <laughs> Thank you so much, Merrick. Alejandro, what do you think about these short-term educations and certification? Well, I can only say in my... Uh profession, which is mathematics, uh, the students learn a lot uh, during the summer schools, workshops, they're essential, essential. Uh, what we teach them in the courses is clearly not enough. They have to go and, and, and work in groups and, and uh, really learn the, the, the new stuff. And it, I, I really am a very big believer in this kind of short term uh, injection of knowledge and intense work. And it had, there has to be follow up, of course, right? And uh, so I, I think that's very important in, in, in every area, every discipline. I can't imagine 
people just sitting back and thinking that what they learn in a formal course setting is enough for them. So and the interactive, also meeting people from around the world and uh, learning the exciting new ideas and the vibes, I think is very important for the, for the new generations as they emerge. I, I'm really a big fan of those. We don't Thank get you. certified. Uh, you know, we're just like, uh, we're math once a mathematician, always a mathematician, but... Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Alejandro. I, I, to I totally, um, uh, I agree with the idea of the international uh, learning as well. This is very important. Um, hopefully they, they open the borders so that we can do in-person stuff too. <laughs> um, Lavinia, what do you think? Yeah. So I believe I'm a great believer as well in taking these small certifications. Um, it gives you a lot of leverage in understanding what is happening around in new trends and keeping up with them. Uh, but something that has always worked with me is that parallelly with this certification, I've always thought that you can, if you can take some volunteering uh, work that resonates with that small um, small uh, certification that you're doing it just brings you a new perspective and you actually maybe in your role you're at a very senior position but when you're volunteering you're at the grassroots level and gives you a lot of uh, different ways to learn as well and apply what you have learned um, and you bring new perspectives right so it's very important that uh, we actually keep up with the certification now with terms of cost right um, I know there is a cost and I'm a huge believer in owning your career. I don't think anybody can take that ownership and cost, it does cost, but there is a huge ROI on it as well. I've always seen that there is a, a return of investment when you actually study and you are able to apply it back as well. It's gonna come back, it's gonna go nowhere. The money is gonna follow. <laughs> Just keep it uh, going. The cost must not be a stopper, yeah. Thank you so much, Lavinia. Very, very, very good point about the cost. <laughs> um, we have a question in the chat. I will read it out and any of the panelists who would like to take it, please just uh, uh, go ahead. Um, Hannah is asking that, I know that the PO has a goal of having 30% of licensed engineers be female by 2030. Do you have any thoughts or options on the best strategies to achieve that goal? I believe that goes to Marissa. Yeah, I can I can start with it, and I, I, I encourage any of the other panelists to sure yes to add. Um, so I mean, first of all, I just want to say that it's a really critical goal. Um, the research out there about kind of like tipping points, you know, the so the thirty three percent. If you want to affect change, it's important to get past that that kind of one third. So um, this one's rounded down to thirty, but uh, you know, achieving thirty percent women newly licensed by 2030 is a minimum, in my opinion, goal for the entering profession after so many years of, uh, of inequality. And, um, and the numbers today, like in, on, in Ontario, for example, I think it's about 13% women that are currently licensed. And, and, and the ones every year, we're getting about 18 or 9% every year getting licensed. So obviously the number is like growing, but huge, um, huge gaps. So, so what do we do? Because we only have 10 more years for that goal, right? That's, that can be pretty quick. Um, I, think the, I think one of the first most effective places to start is actually an industry. Um, I think it was mentioned earlier uh, about um, potentially uh, women having uh, the education and having the like, experience for license, but then they um, select out of the, of the workplace. And I think that um, as much as we can do in our workplaces to um, try to prevent that from happening and maybe try to find some of those young women who did and see if there's ways to bring them back to re-enter because they you know, are so close to being able to become a licensed engineer. So I think that's actually your, your sweet spot of, of one of the biggest areas of change is working closely with industry. And there are some amazing industry partners out there that hire engineers that have phenomenal um, values around equity, diversity, inclusion, phenomenal mentorship and training, uh, phenomenal um, health and wellness benefits, phenomenal ways to support people through leave. And I mean, I think the more that those best practices get adopted by anyone who is seeking engineering talent, 
the better chances that we're going to get to that goal. So that industry partnership piece, I think, is super critical. And um, certainly um, the educational component is a part of it. I think that we're seeing some really great strides in undergraduate education numbers for women. Uh, we are getting past 30% of women graduating, and in some places it's getting up, up higher depending on the school, which is phenomenal at U of T. Our first year classes, um, we've been able to get close to 40%, and then uh, we want to see that obviously come through uh, into the graduation rates. So I think that that's really great, but there's also like a timeline to that, right? Four years of education, four years of experience, at eight, that's eight years from now. So that's why I do think industry is probably the place to focus the most amount of energy in um, uh, early career individuals um, who have um, engineering degrees or an equivalent that can, uh, can seek licensure and really trying to encourage those employers to um, reach out to their employees and see what they can do to support them through the license. And all of us into our network, just be aware of people that maybe have selected out because of some experiences that were not very positive and what we could do to maybe bring them into a better environment to um, get back into uh, completing that engineering cycle. Thank you very much, Marisa. Very, very great points. And uh, I'd like to hear from other panelists if anyone would like to add something yeah, I, I would I would like to add on that one, right? So I think this is a common problem across industries that we face. And it's a great point Maris made that it has to start at the industry as well. So um, working with these different diversity kind of um, initiatives around for a couple of years, one thing I've seen is that how we solve this is, has to be at a multiple level. One thing I see that is at school level itself, we need to also encourage women or girls to participate more in STEM, where uh, a Currently, there is biases which says, or there is this norm that's saying that STEM is not very aligned for girls. And so we have to educate them, make sure that we bring more hands-on there to make them more comfortable and understand. And as well, as, um, as they come out of the industry, we make sure that we hire them and we have that kind of balance in, in organizations. So most of the organizations today are mindful about making sure that uh, there's equal amount of representation as women and men um, are, are available, but also making sure that during the the face of their um, they, uh, it, during their phase in the company as they're growing and they're going through these different phases from, um, from being a mother and all that, how as organizations we can support them and uh, give them that kind of flexibility so that we don't lose them and we actually are able to retain that talent, right? And also have a good amount of uh, mentorship and where people can guide them and somebody who's already been in the industry tells how you can maneuver some of these pain points of balance and uh, being challenged and uh, um, and these kind uh, can be so some of the initiative has to be uh, not only rooted in the in the industry but it has to start from the grassroots level and we address it consistently until the end right so and that's me. I want to jump in again some... and just say that I was remiss in not uh, celebrating uh, NSERC for example so NSERC has amazing leadership in what they've been doing around encouraging uh, diversity of researchers and of research teams. And that has been giving young women wonderful opportunities, by the way, of education and, ex and experience. Uh, MyTax as well has really been focusing on how they can make sure that those industry partnerships are supporting women in marginalized groups, which is phenomenal. Um, and then, of course, you know, TD, for example, is a company that has amazing values and is doing great work within the organization. So I just, you know, I just want to acknowledge the people here because we yeah. have people that we need to celebrate that are actually great contributors to this goal. And of course, Winset is an amazing contributor because they are providing great leadership development. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. Yeah, so I think Marisa, you touched on a very important point. Some of the companies, it's about the leadership and making that conscious effort. And of course, as you mentioned, some of these companies and including TD does a fantastic job in being strong allies. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's a great point that you brought. Thank you. If, if I could make a comment and put on my Winset hat for a moment, um, 
I, I think um, the one thing I would say about that goal is unfortunately it isn't 30% of all registered uh, engineers being women. It is only 30% of new registrants, which I always thought when they started and they set that goal, what a lackluster goal. Why can't we go to something that's a, a BHOG, a big, hairy, audacious goal of, uh, of going for 30%? Uh, of the entire registered uh, population being female. Um, <clears throat> in Winset, um, we started about 10 years ago, we came out of a lot of research um, that said that there's kind of this need to help women in the first 10 years out of school, out of university. That's where we lose them from engineering and science and other professions because they hit the workforce. and. They, they find that it isn't as welcoming. And so um, we developed our leadership program to help women survive, thrive, develop their, their leadership skills and lead at all levels, not just the big L leadership, but to, to learn how to lead within their organizations and be successful in their careers. And it has been, it has been an approach that has, has worked and had impact on, on young women. And actually women in later careers tend to come out to them as well. Um, we've now gone online and we deliver those, but I think the other piece and um, our original founder, Dr. Margaret Ann Armour, who we lost a couple of years ago, um, was very big on the fact that you can't just fix the women to make this change. And I think both of you have touched on that. It's so important to change workplace culture. And right now, there is so much of an appetite of a desire by organizations to make that change. This is the time that we have to work with them and help them with the, the tools. And I, some of our research programs or projects through WinSET, we've worked with some you know, major employers <clears throat> of people in SET. And we've helped them work through strategies. We've learned from it. We've developed more tools. And, and we keep working on that front because fixing the workplace is what is absolutely necessary to make women, give women the opportunity. It's, it's not that you're, you're giving them a, a, an over advantage. What you're trying to do is level up playing field for both men, men and women in, in set workplaces. Oh, great point, Emma. Uh, I love the idea where you said that we need more allies, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's one of our, our um, online uh, webinars is allyship. It came oh. out of uh, one of our uh, recently completed uh, projects where we worked with employers Enbridge, Husky, and share it metals in in Alberta, and um, out of that, there was a I, it was identified as a need to have an allyship, um, you know, within organizations. And so we have an online webinar that helps men and women learn what that means and how to be one. Thanks, uh, Mark. I think Alejandro wanted to add something. Yeah, I just want to say that uh, all these comments are, are are fantastic. I really appreciate them and. For us, it's, it's a learning process, you know. We want to create opportunities uh, through the, the, the funding agencies, the universities, but it's very important that the workplaces, uh, as you say, be receptive and proactive and uh, get the, the baseline of applicants to, to all our programs, increase that pipeline. Of, of, uh, and it goes all the way down to the schools also, right? You know, when, when I see the, the, the still in, in K through 12, situations where uh, girls aren't encouraged to go into science and engineering. I think this, this is, this is a, a very complicated situation and we all have to work together and be modest and understand that sometimes we really have to learn uh, how to um, effectuate change. And it's a, it's a long process and I really, really appreciate what you're saying. And, and uh, you know, our institution, our organization, NSERC is committed to making a difference. I also, of course, want to raise the point of intersectionality, which is very important. Uh, of course, here, I don't think we have that issue, but uh, it's very important, the, the, the issue of gender representation as well as uh, racialized minorities uh, and others uh, uh, that we work, bring everyone forward in the right, in the, the appropriate way that uh, is fully representative of what Canada, who Canada is. Thank you very much, Alejandro. Um, I think, Hannah, your question was really well answered. Um, Susana? Please go ahead, ask your question. Yes, I have a question. Uh, excuse me, I have an allergy, so my voice is a little bit weird. 
But my question is, uh, uh, some of you were uh, concerned about becoming overqualified, right? So my question is, couldn't you put on your resume, for example, relevant education? If you only put bachelor's or, or you only put master's, whatever they ask for. That's not lying, it's not cheating, right? If you go in an interview, they'll ask you, okay, what other education you, do you have? And then you can't mention what other education, no? What do you think? Is it cheating? Would it be cheating if you did that? Or just relevant education? And you put the certificates, the level of education that they are asking for, not more. Thanks, Susanna. Yeah. That's a really very interesting question. I'm not sure. If, I don't think it's yeah, so cheating. I, if, I, if you I, specify relevant, it's not like, yeah. a, it's just the rest of it isn't relevant to that particular job, right? Mm -hmm. So that's yeah, what I, I mean. I, I a solution. A... If you really want to take and you think it would help you to get a master's or a PhD, go for it and then just mention relevant education. Right, thank thank you. Anna. Lavinia, I think you wanted to yeah. answer that. So I think uh, that's a very valid concern that I've heard from many, many uh, people that they actually been very sadly bucketed into overqualified, right? Um, but I, I think the best way to do it is all of us do this is have a resume uh, according to your uh, whom you're trying to sell it to. No, you're right. It's not lying, but it is addressing your audience. You only sell what somebody wants. So make sure that if you can accommodate that thing, wherever you're presenting yourself, you actually align, uh, do a lot of research to understand what they want. And you are actually, uh, these days you have so many venues, don't limit yourself with website, go look at the person whom you're going to talk to, figure out what's their interest, what's their passion, where is their aim aligning towards and try to align to those things, right? Not, not giving, you know, uh, full information is not lying, just limiting and giving only what they need is going to be your key, um, right? So that's what you want to, um, that's what you want to do. Um, yeah, unfortunately, that's, that's really unfortunate that uh, many are bucketed into this, yeah. Thank you very much, Lavinia. Merrick, you wanted to add something? Yes, I was um, having gone through um, outplacement uh, at a point in my career. One of the things that they talked about, uh, not just like you do tailor the resume to what, it, you know, what you're going after, but there's that cover letter. That's your opportunity to go, you've asked for this, 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 this. I had this, 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 this. And, and that selling that you do in that letter is really the place where um, you're not overselling, you're not saying I have this when they don't, you know, that's not something they're asking for. So I think there's a real, there's an opportunity to sell yourself um, to tailor, tailor to the position you're going after. And as long as you're saying I have this and you do have it, I, I agree with you. You're not, you're not misleading them because you have a lot more than that. And maybe that comes up in your interview, but you're showing them that you have what they ask for. Thank you very much, Mark. And uh, uh, we had another question, and uh, same uh, almost uh, context. So I think, uh, Kristen, your question has been sort of answered. And for the sake of the time, we have two more minutes only. I see Julia's hand is up. So because she, she's the boss tonight, because <laughs> she's the Zoom lead, I don't want to mess up with her. Go ahead, Julia. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're OK. Um, uh, but yeah, I'll be super quick. So in, in this time right now, we're really seeing the value of online learning more than ever. And in my current experiences, like I will be 100% honest and say I am that person who really super wanted to be an engineer. And I am in my, within my first five years of graduation and I want out really bad. That might sound super disappointing, but it's just my honest truth right now. So I'm in manufacturing and I'm looking for ways to learn and advance in my career. And a lot of that takes a lot of money. I don't have access to a lot of the tools that you had at university, and I'm still trying to continuously learn. So I'm looking for new ways to learn online, which is including things like data science and Python and, and learning about uh, and doing an online MBA as well. So I'm doing all of these other things, but I feel like I'm veering away from engineering because I'm not get, I don't see the same access to education that I see in other fields right now. So 
in business or doing Linda learning or doing Udemy classes, I don't see the same access to information. I think because there's just this high cost of licensing with certain um, tools that we use in engineering. I'm happy to learn about other things like on the side, but when it comes to my continuous learning, I don't want to be paying an engineering fee while I'm still making not that much money as a, a starting engineer. So it's very hard to continue into my education. Are there ways that us as the engineering community moving forward, now that we know the value of this online education, that we can break down education barriers and maybe bring more women in um, uh, because they can learn from home or they can have, you know, cheaper access to education, continuous education. Maybe they have that engineering degree, but moving forward, how do we ensure that we have good candidates mm -hmm. continuing to learn? And how does that, how will that work in the future? Thank you, Julia. Uh, well, you're closing the breakout rooms. Uh, so one of our panelists yeah. will answer you quickly. <laughs> sure. Yes. Please, uh, anyone who would like to answer. Julia's question. I'm starting on, a, I'm ending on a hardball question. I get it. Okay. <laughs> I, my first question is actually a question back to you, Julia. Are sure. you looking to learn technical engineering yes. skills? That's what you're looking for. Yes. And, and in my career, I find that I, that it's, it's hard to even find jobs where that is included in an oversaturated market of, of manufacturing and design engineers. And mm -hmm. if I'm not being accepted because I'm a woman, which might be the case, I will never know or get that experience in the workplace. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I don't know in Ontario what it's like as far as what, um, uh, what PEO would do. And I think we have someone who can answer the question here. Um, but I know that out here in BC, um, ABC uh, has, uh, they do have um, programs that they offer and then, they're, they're technical, um, they're first, you know, engineers starting out and they're not highly priced. And I'm hopeful that that's, I, I mean, now that they're online, I think you can take them from anywhere. And I would hope that the offering is the same in, in most jurisdictions of Canada where that technical learning is possible online. And uh, I think I'll leave that to maybe someone who will know more. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much. Do you want me to jump in a little bit? Um, yeah, so, I mean, I think it's a phenomenal question and it's a phenomenal aspiration and, and why why not have these opportunities, right? Um, so um, just to just to be clear, so I understood. So Julia, were you saying that you you come from an engineering degree or you, yeah. or, or you, you do, you already have that as your baseline? Okay, sorry. Um, and a master's degree. And a master's degree, oh my gosh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so what can I say? What can I? Uh, what I? What we've noticed? So, for example, if I look at UT right this year, and I'm sure lots of other universities the same. So, because the pandemic, obviously, people had to pivot online, and um, and there's been some great learning about how to give, how to deliver great online curriculum. And in fact, I I think it's uh, maybe Lakehead University that I need to give a shout out to, who uh, one of their professors did an amazing job with their lab to allow students to log in and actually control the equipment in the lab. Um, so they, they really could get a fully hands-on experience. So I think that we are challenging ourselves um, to challenge those boundaries we had in the past for, um, you know, for, lab, for labs and, and the kind of hands-on learning that um, would more traditionally be done in person. So I think that that's really great. Um, in Ontario, there's the Ontario Society for Professional Engineers, which is a organization supporting uh, its members who can be engineering graduates and others and it you know I think provides a series of different training courses in it and it I think connects quite, quite strongly with industry so it might align what it's trying to offer as as, as courses to what industry might be looking for for uh, breaking into new fields and, and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is going to be really interesting to see where we go from here with um, uh, with coming to a new a new future state with uh, hopefully getting through the pandemic um, in terms of what learning will look like because I um, I think a, a tenant of engineering education going forward and has been already has been the the group work the teamwork the you know the working together piece and even you know Alejandro talked about the value of collaboration in your career and so forth 
So it's really important to continue to find ways of teaching that. So it's not so much like Linda's kind of just like learning the subject matter, but more about how do you work in groups and with teams. I think that's a really important piece that has to, you have to find creative ways of doing that virtually um, because the default has been to do that, you know, in person. Um, so I don't know if I've answered your question, but I think you're trying to say okay. like, how do I break through into, into new industries or how do I break through in the area? And so, in some cases that might be trying to find a, a mentor or somebody who has done that or is in, in, a, in a place that you're trying to break through on and then trying to model, you know, what they have to be able to position yourself as well. So. Thank you very that much. Helps. I really appreciate your answer and welcome back everyone from the breakout rooms. That was such a short time coming from, you know, room, small rooms to the big rooms. <laughs> well, virtual world has these uh, privileges. I hope you guys enjoyed um, your discussion in the breakout rooms. We really discussed in the main room, the, all the Q and A's here. Uh, now, unfortunately, we were at the very end of this event, although I would love to talk more. It was just great uh, talks going on, but at this point, uh, we would like to connect with everyone. If you want to connect with each other, just copy paste your LinkedIn profile to the, to the, the chat and, the, and of course, send invitation to each other and also join our Toronto Suister channel at LinkedIn. And we have a LinkedIn group for post event networking. You can go there and there, if there was stuff that you couldn't talk about it today and it's your heart, go and paste it there, comment there, talk about it there. It's, it's an open channel for everyone. We would like to get connected. Okay, and also um, we would we would like we would like to keep in touch with you guys. So follow us on Instagram uh, and also on LinkedIn and Facebook, and sign up for our event bride where it says "Scan me." <laughs> Just take your phone and scan me there. Okay, not scan. Don't scan me. Scan the the the, the thing on the. Um, okay. So we will have a couple of other events coming up. We have coffee clubs where uh, we, we sit and uh, we get um, uh, amazing speakers to talk about the, the stuff about not engineering, not engineering stuff. It's all, all that, but great management tools and stuff. So you can uh, join us there. And also we have Swiss Speaks event where again, we have panel of great, amazing uh, professionals who, who talk about a variety of uh, topics. So just join us there. And it was lovely to meet all of you. Thanks for joining us today. Big thank you to our panelists, to our speakers for honoring us tonight. And I don't want to keep you, all of you, more than this. I look forward to seeing you, all of you, again at our next events. By then, stay safe, healthy, and happy. Bye. Thank you. Have thank you, everyone. Bye. Good thank night. you, Faro. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. You're welcome.